Okay, so uh, good morning to the brave one that managed to uh, wake up after yesterday's um, fondues. Uh, hope you had a great time. Uh, so with no further delay, I wish to introduce you to the morning keynote uh, speaker, who is uh, Professor Kole Dandara from the University of Cape Town. Um, Kole is, um, is above all a good friend uh, that has been involved uh, as a key figure in the um, H3A uh, project. Um, and uh, also has a keen interest in personalized medicine pharmacogenomics. So, um, call it great being here. Uh, great to see you. It has been a long flight from Cape Town here, and uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much. So, uh, it's actually a great pleasure for me to um, to be here, and I will be talking about the efforts that we are uh, taking in in Africa in terms of. Uh, uh, building capacity uh, in pharmacogenomics so that we can actually catalyze implementation of uh, genomic medicine. Um, I'm a, a director of a unit that does um, a, a platform that does research on pharmacogenomics and translation. I'm also currently um, a deputy dean for postgraduate education in our faculty. I'm a fellow of the South African Academy of Science and the African Academy of Science as well. So to just get started, uh, I just wanted to remind you about last night. And, uh, at, at some stage, I was, uh, you know, being 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 African. I was I was expecting that after that food, I would, after that plate of food and potatoes, I would get <laughs> some more meat. But apparently, I was surprised that actually I, I felt full after after this dinner. But thank you so much for the amazing. Um, uh, treatment that you gave us uh, last night. Okay, <clears throat> just to, to get us started and uh, just make a case of uh, pharmacogenomics in Africa, I will speak to three points in my presentation. Who are we as, as Africans in terms of um, where we're going in, 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 in pharmacogenomics? Why would we be bothered about looking at pharmacogenomics and what? Um, efforts we are, we, are, we, are, we are making into that. <clears throat> Africa is a very interesting continent in that it straddles many altitudes. If you look at the, uh, the climate in, in Africa, it's um, a, a continent where you can experience almost uh, all different types of climate. Uh, if you look at the genomic diversity, it is um, where the most diverse genomes are found. Um, if you look also at disease profile, we have got different strata of uh, disease profiles across the continent. However, one of the things that is very prominent in Africa is the brain drain that we suffer. We, it's not like we don't produce experts, but we can't retain them. So <clears throat> we, <clears throat> we will look at the, the issues <clears throat> in Africa, but looking at the, uh, the diversity, uh, of both the, 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 the genomes and geography and the, um, the, the, the disease profiles. If you look um, in terms of when you look in the world in, in the eyes of a geneticist, what we see uh, is the movement of DNA. Uh, you will, um, uh, presenting this in the form of those smarties shows you that um, Africa is where you find the most um, genetically diverse people and just a few of those of, of the underlying DNA moved out of Africa. But what is becoming important is that, um, remember the DNA shapes our, our, our phenotypes, our susceptibility to disease, but most of uh, the discovery for, for drugs uh, is done in the areas where you've got actually the least, um, the, the least genetic diversity. This actually um, is, um, uh, uh, results in a, in a situation where when drugs are produced and then they are presented and marketed now to Africa, uh, new side effects that were never reported before are started to be picked up because now those drugs are now interacting with the uh, genomes or variants that, in, uh, that were never part of the, the clinical trials. <clears throat> um, we, we have carried out studies in Africa that have really shown the, the differentiation of African populations in terms of uh, the, their genetics. But <clears throat> what is important is that you cannot use one African population as a representative of all African populations. There is huge genetic diversity in Africa. Of course, you can actually tease out African populations from uh, other populations in terms of the, uh, the, the genomes. 
But when you come to Africa, instead of taking one population to represent all the population, we need really to study many ethnic groups for us to, to understand the diversity. Here it's actually easier if you look like, like uh, um, uh, Asian populations, <coughs> a, a little bit more when we compare to other populations, more homogeneous. <coughs> so if you look also at a disease profile, I'm just here showing a comparison with, with Europe. You will see that in general, Africa has got a different disease profile. Ours is mostly an infectious disease profile, whereas in Europe it's mostly an NCD profile. So this is quite very important. You will recall when we had COVID and all that, several permutations were made, um, which some of them which never came true because people never took into consideration the underlying inflammation of the, the let's say, infectious diseases and the broad spectrum of responses that is possibly available and, and what would happen with a new infection. So this is also a picture that we must understand when we think about pharmacogenomics, which means the, the sort of uh, the drugs that you find in, in Africa, the, the profile of the drugs will be driven by the profile of diseases that we have, which is different from the profile of drugs that, that would be used in, in, in Europe. <clears throat> it, so here is just to show the same data in a way that really shows you that our top conditions are actually different from the top conditions that you find elsewhere. So our pharmacogenomic it must be driven by what we have in the continent in terms of what are the um, issues, what are the major, but you will see that most of the top red here are actually infectious diseases, and then we've got very little of the uh, uh, NCDs, which is quite different from the picture you get here. So our pharmacogenomics, or where we emphasize, will, will quite be different, um, but complementary, because we're looking at drugs that are uh, invariably used sometimes across the world. So we carried out several studies. This is one of our um, table that shows you uh, variation in uh, drug metabolizing enzymes. Uh, here we are showing you, um, here we, these are uh, different enzymes and then the, uh, underneath each enzyme is a variant. But what you clearly see is that, uh, let me see no, before I go to that, is that there are some variants that you, you, you so all these populations are of African origin, well, it's the, the top ones are of uh, distant African origin. You see there are some variants that you don't find in Africa, but other variants are important in Africa. So when we think about pharmacogenomics, we must be able to tease out, let's say for CYP2D6, you might find some drugs that do well in European populations because they don't have certain variants. And when you introduce those drugs that are metabolized by CYP2D6 in African populations, the variants that are in Africa start to show and, 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 and cause effects to be seen. So it's very important that although other studies are being done elsewhere, we need to study African populations in its um, totality. Here I show also the disease spectrum by age. You will notice that uh, for, for, for Africa, most of the, 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 the disease spectrum is between uh, 5 to 49. This is the working group. So this is the age for people who are working. So there's a lot of the disease that we get impact a lot on productivity because they affect actually the, 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 the working. When you compare to Europe, you find actually, you, you, of course, with aging, you find more disease in the, in, the, in, the, in the older stages. So this also has got implications on, 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 on drugs. What drugs are important, what pharmacogenomics is important to be studied in, in African populations. Um, <clears throat> So, so I just wanted to, to paint that picture so that we are together. But now one issue that we must understand, as much as we're looking at all these different uh, conditions, they, we have major threats, but in, in some cases they occur as comorbidities. So our pharmacogenomics must be um, uh, able to speak to comorbidities and say, how do you then handle uh, situations where there is existence of um, different um, conditions that need to be treated at the same time? Um, I just want to relate um, on a, um, a different study that was carried um, uh, on a study that was done in the U.S., which just a survey which looked at a prescription uh, drug use. It was actually interesting to find that um, 
it's a very, he picked up that they were more than 30% of people were on more than three prescriptions, about 12% were on more than five prescriptions. This is speaking to the comorbidities or co-medications that are needed in different populations. But what is the picture in Africa? We will come to, to that as well. So I just wanted to share this. The day before yesterday, the WHO was celebrating, actually, there's a new uh, second vaccine for malaria. So this actually warms our hearts because malaria is the biggest killer. Uh, it's one of the biggest killers in, in Africa. And Africa is the most affected with the malaria. So at least we've got movement. The, 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 the first vaccine was not as effective. Hopefully this vaccine will get us somewhere because they say it has got about 75% efficacy. So it's some good news that is happening also in, in terms of looking at uh, the populations in Africa. So now I have painted the picture that we now all understand that most of the drug manufacturing, most of the clinical trials are done in populations that are, are not of African origin. So when now these drugs come to Africa, I think there's a huge need for us to do bridging studies. We now have shown you that we have got an underlying different profile of genetic variants. So we need to uh, not just take the drugs as they come, we need to do bridging studies that will show us how each of the new drugs will do in our populations. So um, we need also to uh, take into consideration that the age groups for our affected groups uh, is actually um, mostly the young um, individuals as we do that. So it's known, it's agreed that the burden of adverse um, uh, drug reactions uh, is, is quite huge. Uh, um, data from the US shows that between um, ADRs are, uh, account between the fourth and, and sixth the most common cause of, 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 death, uh, of death. And also they cost the economy is quite a lot of money in terms of um, uh, uh, treating them. Um, however, uh, pharmacogenomics could be the panacea. Now we get into uh, what are we doing in Africa? So I'm showing you here, this is a graph that shows uh, publications that have to do with pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics in, Afri on, uh, in African countries, the research. You will see that uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a re research that is happening. However, you can see that there are some countries where actually no, no, genomics, no genomics or pharmacogenomics research is happening at all. But remember the diversity in Africa, it means that we are still missing some genetic variants that, that might be important for us to understand causes of disease or responses to, to medication. So there is a clarion call for us to really to move uh, together as Africans, together as the world, to, find, to try and see that we characterize as many African populations as possible. I further summarize this graph showing that you can see there are about 15 countries that have no publications in pharmacogenomics or, or pharmacogenetics in Africa. We, we only about two have got more than 100 publications. Of course, if, if we don't compare with other countries in the world, you might think this is quite a lot. I will compare in the next figure. So there is a dire need for us to study African population so that we can tap in its genetic diversity. Here is, when I take all the publications that are done in Africa on pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics, look at Africa, I'm comparing it to countries, not continents. You will see that Africa does quite poorly. Uh, of nearly 38,000 publications in, in pharmacogenomics from 1993 up to today, um, Africa contributes about 1,300. It's, it's a paltry 0.03%. This is the population where we think actually some of the keys to our understanding of biomarkers of diseases are. So I think what I'm trying to call for here is partnership that we characterize as many African populations as possible so that we can understand and, 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 and um, the underlying causes of drug responses and diseases. So we, 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 we have done several studies. I just want to share one study that we did on efavirenz, where we, um, efavirenz um, was, was used as a, um, a standard treatment for, for, for HIV, and all uh, patients were given the same treatment. But what ended up happening was that there were some patients that responded quite adversely to the drug, and a mutation was reported which really showed that individuals who were carriers and homozygous carriers of the mutation were adversely affected. So we did um, uh, a study where we, 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 
we looked at um, coming up with a test which we called gene dosifavirins, which showed that you could actually use the understanding of this mutation, which is actually very common in Africa and rare in other populations, and tailor the drug according to the genotype. Uh, we, we stopped the further development of this test because as, as, um, when we were ready to, 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 to approach the governments to launch these uh, tests to, to be combined with the favorins, Favrins was removed as the main treatment for HIV, and then Dolcegravia came into play. So <clears throat> that's, that, that, that's how we, we, we left that. But currently also with Dolcegravia, we are facing other challenges where there are issues with weight gain in people who are on treatment with Dolcegravia. We have several studies that we are doing on that. So we also worked on warfarin. If you look at the standard package for warfarin that is um, uh, uh, insisted by the FDA, there are variants that one should test for if you are dosing for warfarin. But we did find that actually these variants are not important in African populations. We um, uh, came up with variants that actually are important in African populations there, uh, which actually are different from other uh, variants uh, or algorithms that are used elsewhere. So we are now in the process of <coughs> implementing this waf warfarin dosing algorithm in our local uh, hospital. Uh, the main hospital in, in, in Cape Town. So I want to come <clears throat> back in terms of implementation of pharmacogenomics. So we, wa we are using what we call um, um, evidence-based implementation where we first want to understand what are the common diseases in our region and then what are the most commonly used drugs and look at what are the important genes that we must study. So we carried out a study where we looked at cohorts that were at our disposal, which are nearly 4,000 patients. And then we, um, so they, 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 they constitute, they, they, we had participants were uh, hypertensive, we had a dyspidemic cohort, we had an HIV cohort, we also had a, a cancer cohort. What we uh, identified was that then we matched these um, cohorts with the drugs that were given to each of the participants. And then um, we, 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 we we discovered, we, we actually came up with a list of genes that we think are the ones that we should implement first. The first um, uh, diagram there is showing you um, uh, those patients who, who were uh, uh, dyslipidemic, and this way the other core prescriptions that they were getting. You, so there's a lot of drugs that are given together. So this would then inform us to say what are the important genes that we might look at in terms of implementing tests for um, for dyslipidemia. We also looked at uh, uh, those participants who were on tamoxifen for breast cancer. You can see here how many other uh, drugs these participants were on, which shows, which speaks to the comorbidities and need for co-prescription. Now, as we think of our pharmacogenomics, we must start thinking about how do we deal with where we have got several drugs. In some patients, they, they had up to five medications that were given at the same time. And then we also looked at those patients who were on uh, uh, um, arterial fibrillation, who were on warfarin, and what were the most common drugs that they were on. And all this information allowed us to then come up with a list of genes that we think is important in our population, that we think we should look at all its variations. We must um, deep sequence these genes and then implement early um, pharmacogenomic tests for this population. So having painted this picture, I'm really inspired by one of our heroes in Africa, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, who at one stage had to say that the independence of Ghana uh, was meaningless unless it was li linked to the total liberation of Africa. I want to add that uh, all the, what has been showing uh, you here are isolated research that, that we have been doing in Africa this is not going to be impactful if we, contain, if we continue that way. We need really to work in an integrated way. So what we've um, realized and accepted is that there are fewer expertise in genomics in Africa. There's even uh, fewer people with pharmacogenomic knowledge, and we've got difficulty in access platforms for genetic characterization, and there's a lack of understanding of genomics. So in order for us to do this, there were steps that were taken. I'm proud to say since 2003, we had the first meeting that was thinking about pharmacogenomics in Kenya. And we, 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 we soldiered on. And in 2019, we really came together and said we really have to 
realized this, and then we formed the African Pharmacogenomics Consortium. And that consortium uh, now is, um, we call this African Pharmacogenomics Consortium or network, which is APN, is now to leverage our capacity so that we can work together as one in Africa so that we can deliver on the promise of pharmacogenomics. We want to actually establish centers of excellence. We want to, uh, to, to do clinical trials across the continent. We want to foster networking to develop uh, pharmacogenomic guidelines for Africa and also advocacy so that people can uh, move with us in terms of um, um, pharmacogenomics. Um, Currently, we have been running, um, um, uh, we've got several activities. We've been running a very successful webinar series. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, <coughs> Victoria Nebaware here, who, who is coordinating those uh, activities. And um, we, we have got several activities that are lined up. So the first two, we are already doing that. We really would want a partnership with uh, the rest of the world so that we can realize um, some of these um, activities. Um, one of our, we just made one of our, our, our uh, webinars. We had um, around 272 registrations for the first webinar, and it was actually heartwarming to, to see that the audience was coming from across the world, the Americas and Canada, we, a lot from Africa, around Europe, and also Asia on our webinar series. So we seem to be attracting the, 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 the right audience and we are very much inspired that we must continue on that. But the important aspect is that uh, in the first webinar we had 28 African countries and of these four of them have no uh, pharmacogenomic or pharmacogenetic studies published. So we are reaching out. So we, we want to find out ways where we can recruit even students from such countries train them in areas that have good capacity so that we can actually spread the expertise across the, uh, the, the, the continent. So as part of, of, of the African Pharmacogenomics Network as well, um, we have formed inside there what we call a consortium for genomics and therapeutics in Africa, uh, which has attracted funding from the uh, Gates Foundation, where we are, we are doing uh, clinical trials um, on tamoxifen, we are doing on um, uh, hydroxyurea for sickle cell, um, and we, we're going to start on warfarin. So this, these are some of the activities that are ongoing. So how we work with this is that we, we, we partner, each of the groups partners with a major hospital, and then we have signed what we call a consortium agreement, and so, so we, we work together. You, uh, in your own section, you you recruit patients that become part of the combined patients that, that, that respond to each of the three research areas that we are doing. We are looking forward to expanding and bringing on more people as we, <coughs> as we, as we grow. Um, also, one of the latest uh, uh, things that has happened, if you think of pharmacogenomics, sometimes we don't just want to rush to the human. We want to have models. One of the models that has been lacking in Africa is the human liver model. If you look in um, many pharmaceutical companies here in Europe and across the world, they use human liver models. We also sometimes buy them, but they did lack the African genetic diversity. So um, Michelle Rams's group, uh, she, she's not here, she has left, um, with a colleague of mine, Colin Masimirembwa, they developed um, a biorepository for African liver tissue which actually has now been characterized, now can be used. When new drugs come, we first want to put them in, those, in, the, in the African liver tissue to see what is the response uh, to, 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 the, to the different enzymes as part of um, safety and efficacy assessment before we put uh, uh, drugs to the, to the humans. So one of the activities also that we um, were intending to do as part of the African Pharmacogenomic Network is that we want to, uh, we are developing a, sh a short training course. We should come uh, online next year. We, we want to seek partnership. Uh, I know uh, colleagues who have been there before, so we will be reaching out to you uh, because we really want to grow expertise and advocacy in, in pharmacogenomics in, uh, in, in, in Africa. And we will work with existing initiatives that are already um, on the continent, uh, including the African Genomic Medicine Training Initiative. Um, so 
I, I would want to end my call by acknowledging colleagues who are part of the African Pharmacogenomic Network. Um, our uh, uh, chairperson or president is Colin Masimine uh, there, and then um, several colleagues that are there. I want to acknowledge Vicky there, there uh, Ambrose Wongam, who is um, uh, our president for the African Society. All these colleagues actually make a huge contribution for us to continue pushing so that we can characterize African populations and um, uh, one day uh, uh, realize the, um, the goodness of uh, uh, genomic medicine. So I really would want to thank you and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Colette. Are there any questions? Please. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, uh, great presentation. So my question is about the uh, epidemiology transition that is expected in Africa. I know you've emphasized <coughs> that currently in Africa there is a lot of infectious disease, but studies have shown that uh, we don't need to wait because we see a trend, uh, we see decline in infectious disease, and you mm. mentioned that's like malaria, mm. and now we now see a big uh, non communicable disease now appearing in different parts of Africa. So my question is that should we be waiting until they are here with us before they become a priority or you think this is time to focus on non communicable disease? Uh, thank you very much. I think we are in a very unique position that we have got both. So we, 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 we can't wait. What I wanted to emphasize is that we shouldn't ignore the infectious diseases. And so Yes, there is a, a huge transition that we're seeing uh, going to, but we are still stuck with, also with infectious disease. So we have got the option time to, to do both. That's why you will see the profile of drugs that we use will be quite different because we've got both issues as a, as a, as a problem in our area. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I was wondering, what if you have that enough evidence that there are these variants that are specific for these countries? And what after all the scientific evidence that proves the importance of doing these tests? But what if you, they are not, they don't, you don't show enough uh, evidence of cost effectiveness of doing these tests and that governments won't like uh, adopt these, uh, the, all the scientific evidence you provide because of the cost of these tests? Uh, I know that it, uh, it, is, it, it needs proof that this is cost effective to, to do this test before mm. giving the drug rather than waiting for the side effect to. Yeah. So, you, what about you? What, what do you think about this? It's a very important question. I think we have all been uh, dealing with the issue about, um, about how much a, the bar of evidence that is required of pharmacogenomics, even in the drugs that we use today. Even the clinical parameters that are used today, they are not 100%, but they are used. So across the world, you see the bar for pharmacogenomics is so much high. But uh, if we take it as an additional tool, not replacing what is there, I think it should be acceptable. But the model, we have, we have currently been given the, uh, our platform to try at the hospital. The model is that we want to do what we call preemptive pharmacogenomics, where the initial cost might seem high, but when, once we get your data, your, gen, your, gen, your genetics doesn't change. When you come again to the clinic, if we keep better clinical records, you use the same data and the cost is going down all the time. So that's our persuasion to the government to say, yes, we might, it might be $100 in the beginning, but when you come for treatment three times, if we divide that, your cost for genotyping is going down. But you are actually saving a lot of um, uh, staying away from adverse effects as well as um, unnecessary hospitalization. It's a, it, I think it's a, a debate we have to do through advocacy. Yeah. We also have to remember that cost effectiveness is not simply about cost, but also quality of life. So, 
It may be more expensive, but if the quality of life is better. Other questions? Mark, please. Thank you, Colette, for a great talk on an essential topic. Um, I think maybe I got it wrong, but you mentioned uh, African liver tissue for functional studies. And so if I may be a bit provocative, yeah. uh, how many would you need? I mean, uh, if you take uh, one sample and want to infer for another patient in Africa somewhere else, mm -hmm. uh, will it be better representative than, I would say, European liver tissue or, or any other reference? And then what would be your perspective? How many would you need? How, how mm -hmm. many populations do you think need to sample? And that, that's a, a, a good question. Currently, they have about 67 liver samples. They just started. And, but the interesting aspect, which I have not shown, is they have characterized some of the major variants that you find in African populations, which is quite great. So, yes, we would need, we would need many, but the, uh, the, the few that will be there are much more representative than the, the European liver tissue to the African patients. But we're not doing away with the European liver tissue to be an additional, to say, what do we find with this? And additionally, with the Africans, actually, it gives us better data together. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for a wonderful uh, talk and, and work in this space. Um, you know, a lot of the examples you showed was with small molecule drugs. Uh, as you know, a lot of, a lot of drugs are our biologics now. Mm -hmm. So what, what do we know about uh, biologics in, in different populations? And also with, with you know, genetic medicines uh, coming out like editing sRNAs and, and so forth, what, where do you see the field of pharma, pharmacogenomics going with, with these types of drugs coming out? It's a very interesting area. I, I have not personally worked on the pharmacogenomics of biologics, but um, I think what would be important are the, the targets already. You, you, you see, because the pharmacodynamics is important in pharmacogenomics. So the targets of those biologics, sometimes if they are differing in different populations. But I think it's more now, more individualized, the way we're looking at precision medicine, we're looking at the individual themselves. So there will be those differences as well. But I've, I've, not, I've not done studies in that. George, do you, do, you, do you want to comment on biologics? I've not done that. <coughs> I don't think it's an issue so much of the drug itself. It's about um, how this relates to the gene or gene network that participates and occasionally drug-drug gene interactions. So that's a question that is literally at the moment a black box. So I have absolutely no idea how the interplay between different drugs um, uh, correlates with the genetic signature that could allow us to predict the drug dose adjustment, um, especially in psychiatry. So in our own clinical study, uh, prospective one, preemptive one, we had a patient that received even 22 drug cocktail, 22. And the average, and the average drug um, uh, combination was something like uh, 10. But we have seen, for example, and that's currently in, in revision, the, the papers under revision, that uh, if you rationalize your, your drug dose based on the genetic profile without taking any consideration uh, of the polypharmacy, you bring down uh, the average drug numbers from five to four. So comparing the uh, control arm with, with the study arm, with the genome guided arm. It's one drug less, but even that is important. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, thanks for such an interesting talk. Um, I wanted to ask also a, a bit of a provocative question um, because we all know that with multimorbidity in polypharmacy, uh, the polypel has been uh, yeah. the subject of a lot, lot, lot of discussion. Yeah, um, and I was just at a, a talk at ESC by Valentin Fuster, the effect of which was that essentially their development of a very basic polypel got delayed like 15 years because they first tried to use Simbisatin, which as we all know is the yeah. subject of quite a lot of pharmacokinetic uh, differences. Um, but looking at the different prevalence in, in regions and, and uh, geographic mm. areas of, of different very common poly um, pharmacogenes, I, I personally feel extremely skeptical that we could ever do a good job with a poly pill that would be equally uh, good for different populations. Um, but I would be really keen to hear everyone else's <laughs> perspectives. Yes, that, that, that's an interesting one. We, we're getting into, into that area in, in, in terms of poly pill. But like what George was saying, 
we already um, unconsciously we're giving people m m m a lot of medications together. So I, I would agree with you that the polypus must be tailored to the disease profile of a region. But you need to be mindful that um, in, for infectious, let's say if you include anything that will uh, temper with infectious diseases, you might actually create resistance. So you might have a region that has got higher levels, so let, let's say of hypertension, the, the polypus must be tailored into that, but you must be mindful of what is happening with other conditions uh, so that you don't all of a sudden make some of the uh, uh, conditions untreatable later because of prior exposure to lower doses of particular drugs. So it's, 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 it's a very tricky area, but I, I think the way to go is to have, I think, regionalized the sort of polypus that are taking into account the genetics and the disease profile of a region for, for it to be meaningful. Thank you.